Sounds Scene. Hello there, welcome to Sound Scene, a podcast about how music supervisors use music to tell visual stories. Sounds Scene. Hey, welcome back, or thanks for joining. Um, if it's your first time listening to Sound Scene, my name's Raf Senavaratna. Uh, I'm a music supervisor in the making, based in London. So today my guest is Megan Currier. Uh, Megan is a music supervisor for film, television, and advertising, based in New York. And for the past 11 years or so, she's worked super closely with one of the dons of music supervision, Randall Poster, who's known for his close collaboration with Wes Anderson uh, on, on all of his films, from Bottle Rocket right at the start to Grand Budapest Hotel all the way up to his new one, um, The French Dispatch, coming out this year, hopefully, touch wood. So Megan's assistant on the Wes films, but outside of that, her and Randall have worked together on films including The Joker, The Irishman, Wolf of Wall Street, Skyfall, Boyhood, um, and if that's not enough, some big bloody TV series, uh, including HBO's Boardwalk Empire, and vinyl, to name a few. Megan's supervision work has also extended far and wide from Tiger King, which feels like an eternity ago, to uh, the Trey Schultz film Waves. And it's the latter which we're going to be speaking about. Um, I mean, I was spoilt for choice considering everything that Megan's worked on, but Waves is an incredible film. It's super beautiful, and the music in the film was one of the biggest talking points from critics afterwards because the score is uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross so it's uh, outstanding but the soundtrack um, has like a couple Kanye songs five or six Frank Ocean songs Tame Impala and a bunch more Um, so I'm just really keen to find out more about that so hi Megan hi how's it going good thanks for coming on (laughs) thanks for having me you're welcome um so, yeah, talking about Waves, can you tell us about how your role played out as music su- supervisor on Waves? Like, at, I'm curious just how the whole process starts at the start of the project. Hmm. Well, Waves was a was an interesting project because um, Randall Poster and myself, we co-supervised this together received um, a very, 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 very rough assembly after it was already shot. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we weren't involved from the beginning before they started production, which is not unusual. Um, And sorry, what's the, what's the assembly? Do do you mean the, just a rough edit? Like uh, an assembly is, is considered the roughest form of an edit, but not even considered an edit yet. Okay. So it's like it's like before before really most producers see it before they do like a family and friends screening. It's the it's the very first sort of stitched together fabric of of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, way before a director's cut or a fine cut. And so they actually sent us the script, even though it was already shot and in the process of being put into an assembly. So I read this script and for starters, and Trey, who I think is amazing, um, the way that this script read was not only were, you know, camera angles in each scene description or the way he wanted it to move, but he also was very specific about the musical landscape. And to the point where he was, he was saying which specific songs he wanted to play where and how they were going to function within the actual context of the picture and the acting and the camera movement and the choreography wow. of the camera. And so he also it was really interesting. He would put in links to the song that he's mentioning for each, for each scene. So you are able to actually play it in the background if you choose to while you're reading this. So read this script and I was like, this is, this is incredibly beautiful, but the, you know, I had no idea how it was going to actually look. Cause so many times you can read a script and you're like, 
eh, this is garbage. And then it turns out being extraordinary once there is a picture or you, you read something and you're like, this is, this is gorgeous, but it's just not executed how it would have been imagined. So, mm-hmm. you know, reading it, I was, I was, in, I was very intrigued. I thought it was, it was gorgeous. And, um, upon seeing this assembly, it completely delivered, even though it was way too, you know, it was way too long for like a, an actual audience to watch. Um, right. I just remember watching this assembly and I, I was floored. Like I, I think I ran into Randy's office and I was like, you have to see this. This is for me, this is like a pop Terrence Malick level beautiful. Mm. So, you know, so I, so we, we watched this rough assembly and it was beautiful. And, you know, we ended up having a meeting with Trey and two of the executive producers. And we're just talking about the mechanics and, and, and really the challenges of how ambitious the film was musically. Um, and at that point, he had mentioned that, you know, he was already speaking with Trent and Atticus about doing the score, which is always like awesome. If you're already having real conversations with them, then that is, that is a talking point as well right. for other artists that you're approaching to right. license their, their music or, or their publishers or their, the people who are their reps at the labels. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. even though we were hired after this film was already shot, it was very clear um, the challenges that laid before us financially um, as well as creatively if something wasn't going to work out. And I think that, you know, the role of the music supervisor can fluctuate um, depending on what the project is. For sure. So in this case, it because it everything that was scripted and all the musical choices that the director made, the vision it was com- it was complete already. So there wasn't there wasn't much you know shepherding that needed to happen on a creative level because he, you know this director is already very musical and was being very surgical about what he wanted to accomplish with the music within the body of the of the rest of of the film so our role within this specific film mm-hmm. was to, truly just to support the director in fulfilling this vision by firstly just trying to get everything that was you know, scripted and 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 placed and already edited in the picture, clear. Right. And did he did he have like everything scripted in already, or were there points where he was looking to you guys for guidance? Um. Yes. So you know, seeing the the first assembly, and then as as the cuts progressed, and you know, there was a locked cut. Um, for, I would say pretty much everything that he had in mind before even shooting um, was in the film. So it was our responsibility to actually go clear it. And there were a couple instances where something um, was not clearing. So yes, we would creatively you know, send options and alternatives and find other creative solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say you know, the majority of what is in the film um, was already a part of his vision before he even shot it. Yeah. You know, thanks to the producers at A24, and uh, you know they they were really champion championing him. <laughs> you know, like they were they were really they they really were incredibly supportive, even though the budget was challenging and um, they knew it was going to be a, a high price tag. Just again because of the sheer volume of music that's in this film. Yeah. Yeah. And and not just that, but as you said, it was so kind of tightly woven into the DNA of of his script and the, and the cuts and stuff. But I will say about that, though, I think you know, to Trey's credit, you know, the 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 producers and the distributor, they they also saw his vision, and that's why they really were there to be supportive. Yeah. Yes, creatively, but also financially. Right. Right. I also kind of, I love in the film that there's this kind of plot divergence where the first half of the film is centered around, I guess, the son being the protagonist and then it kind of moves to the perspective of his sister. Um, And I love that shift in kind of 
uh, what's it, the Bradley Cooper and Ryan Gosling place beyond the pines mm-hmm. film where you kind of have that shift as well of who they're focusing on. Um, how do you feel like the music and so many like big culturally prominent songs serve to kind of change or represent this shift in perspective? Um, and in general, sorry, this is a super loaded question, but what what do you think was the role of the music in this in this film? Well, the, I mean, I don't want to give any spoil spoiler alerts in case anyone who might be listening hasn't seen this film. But you know, the first half of the film um, it does very much center around Tyler, um, who is the son, and you know, you from the very first scene, you you get this. Um, a fully visceral experience of of what his life is like. You know, he's this very handsome, gregarious, party guy who's a wrestler, and he has this beautiful girlfriend, and he has these cool friends, and they they live in this you know seeming seemingly what feels like you know a, a a paradise to a teenager, and you know he we're sort of on this roller coaster with him. Um, so musically, it's very, um, it's very layered. It's really fast. There's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of action. Um, but it starts to come to a head. And so it is very much centered around driving pieces of music and driving hip hop and, and ultimately it really served as a vehicle to reinforce the speed of his life that ultimately ends in in a, in a very tragic event that breaks apart his family. And the B-side or the second half of the film, which follows his sister, you know, she's always holding that grief with her. She can accept it, but like she's always holding it with her. So it is a significantly quieter, um, element to the film when we start focusing on her story and her path of accepting what happened ultimately. Um, right. Because she, she, you know, now that she's now that she's growing up and becoming a teenager as well, it's actually a really beautiful juxtaposition to what we previously saw uh, in the first half of the film. So, you know, that was a very intentional decision um, on Trey's part, really, to have the opposite side of, of the coin, you know? So the first half of the film was this high intensity, aggra- you know, there's aggression, there's movement, there's energy, it's really in your face, it's constantly coming at you. Mm. And then the flip side is, you know, with, with, his, with Tyler's sister, it's, internalized it's it's a slower it's softer there's more space even within like the the camera work there's there's just more space so i think that musically it really it reinforced to show this juxtaposition between the two characters right but also between these two sentiments of like high energy go 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 and then grief and stillness and quietness yeah, that's really beautiful. Um, you, you describe it really nicely as well. I feel like you have this ability to articulate the music through both like an emotional center and a technical one. Do you feel like that this role as kind of a conduit or a translator is almost a tenet of being a music supervisor and that you have to kind of sit between, say, director or musicians or artists or production or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, um, sometimes, sometimes you're working with a director or an editor who is incredibly musical. Um, and sometimes you are not, and they really look to you, um, for guidance to be a translator. And I actually tell that to people often that like, I'm here to support you in any way that you need. So, don't worry about not having like technical musical language. I actually always tell directors like 
when you're speaking with a composer or me, but like specifically when it comes to composers, because composers are so technical, you know, music theory driven, right. um, you know, they might start saying, oh, do you prefer a cello or do you prefer a clarinet or do you prefer a whatever? And the director might not know necessarily what that sounds like within the actual context of a cue that they're listening to. Right. So I always say, I'm here to help you be a translator, but I always say to explain what you want to happen emotionally as best you can, because, because, you know, a composer would be like, Oh, okay. You want something to feel, you know, really internal and, and small, but raging. Just like, you know, your little fists are all balled up. Like I want it to sound like that. And it's mm -hmm. like, got it okay so then a composer will be able to also interpret that but um i do think that it is a tenant of a of a mu music supervisor and a and a good one um and i hope that i'm considered a good one <laughs> but like but like to yes to be able to find different ways of can of explaining emotion and how music can support that emotion or create that emotion, you know? Sometimes when we're putting, trying different ideas to picture, instinctually an editor or a director might think that, you know, like a Metallica song is the right way to go for a, a, a car chase, mm -hmm. something like fast and, and, and high speed or whatever. But then when you're actually trying other things to it, you're like, no, actually, if you throw on like a, a Mozart concerto, it completely flips around your your perception of what's happening. Right. But it could still almost hit on what they're trying to get at at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you navigate that? Like when you're working with a director or a showrunner and they've got a certain idea in mind and, and potentially that could work. But then when you almost feel that there's this other thing that it could be, how do you kind of broach that with them at risk of kind of challenging what they had in mind? Well, I always, I always like to approach any project in a, a really collaborative way. And it is my job to serve the director serves the producers and serve that vision. Mm -hmm. But I always tell, you know, directors and, and producers, you know, sure, it might be scripted like this, but sometimes the picture is going to ask for something else. And so as long as you can be open to that, then you know, something magical can happen. But often, you know, a director is very, very firm in wanting to use a piece of music or having a certain sort of textural, you know, a score cue. Um, and, and it works, you know, yeah, it works. Great. Let's move on. Or if I feel really strongly or if I'm like just ugh, allergic to something and I know why, um, I have no problem, you know, discussing that with a director. And, you know, even if you disagree, you may end up somewhere really interesting and finding something different. Then that happens, you know, or, you know, especially if there's a musical choice that's supposed to happen on camera that you do have to commit to before shooting it. So you have to clear it beforehand. We have to commit to this song or you know artist or whatever it be so we can we can do all the proper steps in getting it clear so then you're you, mm -hmm. you know you're married to it unless you completely change the way it's edited but um unless it's very specific from from the director's perspective um that's where a lot of open-ended conversation happens right just because like yeah once you shoot it that's what it is Right. Okay. Um, unless you shoot it with a couple different songs, which often happens, you know, and often if there is a little bit of waffling about, oh, I'm not sure if this is the right song, you know, then I'll always say shoot it with and without if you have time, <laughs> time and money. But, you know, why not? If we're going to be recording a, a new piece of music mm -hmm. um, and you don't know how long the scene is going to be, why don't we re-record or, or record rather? three or four songs and then your on-camera person who's ever performing 
you know, then you have options. And so you give them all to them yeah. and then you have options, you know? So there's always creative ways to work around that. I think that I've completely gone off <laughs> topic of what your question was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but it, it definitely aligns. And it, on that, like, obviously a lot of what was in Waves was was scripted in and woven in. And you touched on it before, but there are some like staggering tracks included. And I think in particular of like the several Frank Ocean tracks. And when I was watching the film, my music supervisor head was thinking, this must have been so expensive. Uh, you don't hear many Frank Ocean songs in many films. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you pull this off? Um, and what did you... What do you think is key to kind of creatively securing licenses for tracks within within budget? Um, well, I can say that this film was not within budget. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, but it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't wild. It wasn't wildly out of you know. It wasn't like triple or or, or double even or anything over budget. Um, so like with the Frank Ocean example, yes, he's, he's notoriously, um, very protective of his art because when you think about it, like if you're, if you're licensing your song for a film, let alone uh, multiple songs mm. from your, from your canon for a film, um, it's, it's saying something about it's you. It's saying something about you. Absolutely. You know, and also with, with, Everyone knows the situation with Frank Ocean and his label and you know pre previous material that's still control controlled you know with implicit quotes by the label you know this woman his publisher Megan Goldstein at BMG shout out to Megan Goldstein she made it happen now seriously you know I've worked with I've worked with I've worked with Megan for 10 11 years on various projects Right. And in explaining the film just to her from an artistic perspective, because um, it's really a masterful film and a very beautiful and tasteful way that Trey envisioned the musical element of this film, she was really able to get through to, you know, his lawyers, him, um, you know, it also helps as well, which isn't typical for offer, offering for the artist to see the film, to see the scenes in which we are wanting to use the songs. Um, you know, Trey as an artist, as a filmmaker was always willing to mm. get on the phone with whomever he needed to, or to write a letter. Um, because it was a deeply personal film to him as well. So by being patient and by being open to sharing any information that someone like Frank Ocean wanted to know, I think that that happened. I think ultimately because we licensed, um, I wanna say five or six of his songs, we were able to come to an agreement um, that was satisfying for all parties um, contingent on using all six songs. Right. So that is also really helpful, um, in some cases as well. Um, not necessarily in waves, but offering an MFN quote is also very helpful, especially if there are other artists who are agreeing to a fee and other artists are just as, you know, exclusive in caliber and in artistry then people feel like they're all getting, you know, a, a fair deal. Um, yeah. Even if it might not be, you know, a hundred million dollar film, you know, this is, this is not a hundred million dollar film. This is, this is yeah. considered relatively mid to, to low budget in the grand scheme of things. Right. But I think, I honestly think just because this film is so special and people started approving and getting on board, yeah. that that others started to agree right well. so it kind of snowballs in that way can can you megan describe um mfn most favored nations for those listening just briefly like what it means yeah so most favored nations is sometimes a very helpful or sometimes a very hindering <laughs> little piece of language in um in music licensing <laughs> three words say them and i'm yours <laughs> Um, essentially what MFN means is 
you know, if let's say you, Ra, are like, Megan, you can use my song, you know, X, Y, Z for a hundred dollars, MFN, all songs in the film. That then means if anyone else in any, any other piece of music that's licensed in the film that exceeds a hundred dollars, your fee goes up to whatever that highest number is. You know, you can say MFN with publishing. So if you own the master side, but not the publishing, um, you can say, I'm going to quote a hundred dollars, but MFN with the publisher of the same song. And if the publisher quotes $200, then you both get $200. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of evens a, a playing field right. um, in terms of finances. Um, it can sometimes um, blow your budget up when that happens, but sometimes it can keep things keep it on, you know, under the ceiling. So you're like, hey, right. you know what? Share agreed to $100. Mm-hmm. So can you do MFN with the share song? People would be like, fuck yeah, I'm doing, you know, like, so, so then you're like, Hey, share and Elvis both agreed to a hundred dollars. I mean, this would never happen because it's we're talking about share and Elvis, but like, so then people are like, well, if share and Elvis are agreeing to that. Then I will too. Right. You know? So sometimes it can really help you keep a budget under, under the ceiling, especially if it's a lower budget film. Right. Um, that doesn't have, doesn't, doesn't, you know, can't find magic money somewhere okay. to help with your music licensing, which can quickly add up. It's one of my biggest problems is like people are like, music's expensive. Music has added value to your film. Do you feel, do you feel that directors, again, this is broad strokes, but do yeah. you think generally that um, directors or producers value music as a line item in the budget uh, to the value that you feel it should be valued at? I said value a lot just then, but. Um, I think everyone values music very much. I think that sometimes they just don't understand the reality of, of what is wanted and how much it actually is going to be. Um, often it's not commensurate with what it should be. And that's why people do often go over budget, right? even if they already have a, a, a healthy music licensing budget. Um, but it really just depends on the project, you know? It really depends on who's producing. It depends on how soon, you know, I'm brought on to a production mm-hmm. and I can read a script. And then I'm like, hey, really like this script. I want to do this, but we need to have a come to Jesus moment about your expectations and your budget for licensing. Right. You know, there's always creative ways to deal with the lack of, of funds. Yeah. You know, you can re- record your own master. You can create a brand new song. You, there, I mean, there's so many amazing musicians out there and bands and artists that are not, you know, major pop stars and rock stars on the biggest record labels with the biggest publishers in the world. Mm-hmm. But if that's what you do want, the biggest names um, with the biggest, you know, entities that administer their material, then it's like the reality is this. Yeah. But sometimes that's where the MFN can be helpful. I don't think people do step deals anymore, but that's where sometimes step deals could be helpful. And yeah, so it really just depends on the project. Yeah. And then and then often you'll have people like Trey who knows very well that he's writing in Kanye West songs, <laughs> Hendrick Lamar songs and just like Frank Ocean song. You know, it's like it's it's he's you know that he's very aware of that and he knows the value of the music and he yeah. you know not only to the artists he wants to license from but also for the picture he knows that it's added value to the picture um so yeah yeah and i i at at that point he just believes also in the value of what he's creating ultimately yeah absolutely and the music's a huge part of that for sure and and on the other side of the music uh we we talked about uh trent reznor and atticus ross being behind the, the original score and from some interviews that i read it, my understanding was that Trent actually reached out to to Trey to say that 
um, he was a big fan of his work, which is really cool. Um, I was curious to know if there was a communication channel between you and Randy as music supervisors and uh, the composers. Like, how did you ensure that the interplay between score and the licensed music is cohesive? I mean, um, there there was not, um, which is unusual. Uh -huh. But I think that this is a, a very unique situation. I mean, Trey edited the majority of this movie. Wow. Like, he, he had an editor, but he started editing all of this at home in Florida. Like, he's very, he's very close to his materials. Mm -hmm. And you've seen the movie, the, the way that it's all really just seamlessly works together. And he's so musical and and knows instinctually how he wants the music to function, both score and license music, he was always just speaking with them direct. You know, on projects, typically, if there's a, if there's a director that has a relationship with a specific composer right. and they always work together, it's, I don't need to get involved. Right. But um, if it's, hey, completely different concept for my new film, and I want to explore uh, a different kind of composer than, you know, helping them figure out who the best matches for them um, for the project, but also personality wise. Right. Because then once once a composer is on board, I like to step away and let the director and the composer communicate directly unless there's something problematic. OK. Um, you know, which, you know, someone doesn't understand something or the director's like, I don't like what's what's being sent back to me um then i will get re-engaged with them on on that front okay but yeah i usually keep my my role out of composer territory unless i'm watching something out and i'm like i don't know i don't know if this is working you know or you know anything like that but the everyday back and forth that's not that's not something that i get involved with okay so they like more or less, once you you say scout someone for them, you you do operate more or less in a silo mm -hmm. from them. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I'll listen to the cues and I'll look at it within the context, and right. you know there there often will be dialogue about about how the score is evolving, um, but a lot of times I'm there to make sure that it is evolving and there is cues being revised and being resent back to, you know, music editor to lay it in and to, and to continue finishing. Um, but unless there's something like deeply not gelling, um, even, even just me personally, I like to just let the director communicate with, with the composer. I'm like, I don't need to be on copy unless you're feeling funky about what's being turned back. Uh huh. So, so then how do you ensure that cohesiveness between licensed music and score? Or is that more, does that, I guess that sits more with the director at the end of the day, because that's the final output. Well, yeah, no, I mean, even before, even, I mean, Waves is a very specific example, um, just because there's so much music in it, that the score, which is so beautiful, it really, it really sort of, it helps encapsulate the world. So, you know, in, in most typically when, when we start editing, um, there's a lot of temp score that's used in, in the rough cuts. So, you know, might not be perfect, might not be right for this film, but using other pieces of music to help give like shape and rhythm and dynamism. So you you end up spotting different moments within the the movie where score will go or where a song will go or hmm, wouldn't it be interesting if we used a song here for this montage instead of score or vice versa. So that element of spotting and trying to use different temp pieces of score. I mean, that's that's very normal, but that's not something that was done in waves just okay. because there was so much music that needed to just be wrangled yeah. that it was very clear with this specific movie that this was our role. Right. Can, can you give me an example of a, a film or, or any project um, that you worked on where 
you were involved at that earlier stage and were more defining the musical kind of journey and plan, so, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, um, I would say one of the best examples is Vinyl, which was on HBO a couple of years back, um, which is a show that was all about the music industry and a ton of on-camera musical moments. Mm. And we, Randy and I did that one together as well. Like we used to have meetings and, and constant conversations with the writers for reference and sending music back and forth, even with just the writers as they were co- you know, coming up with this wow. story. So being involved from that inception through production, doing re-recordings of all these iconic you know, bands and songs, be it the Velvet Underground or... Um, Alice Cooper or you know whatever it might be so like re-recording all of these things but also as an extra little wink because most of the people that we recorded or re-recorded some of these iconic rock and roll moments are with with contemporary contemporary working artists so like Julian Casablancas was basically the voice of Lou Reed or like Uh, we had Andrew WK for the voice of Alice Cooper. So it's like, so that was like an extra little thing. So we're re-recording all of this. We are working with the, the um, casting department, finding real musicians who could actually play along to the re-recordings on camera. We're rehearsing them. We're getting, we're on set doing all the, you know, we're not doing the playback, but working with the sound department and the Pro Tools playback operator. Wow. And then once we're in post-production, like sitting really closely with, with the editorial teams and just feeding them music and helping them work through the various, you know, the, the, the various, elements that really made that era significantly um, varietal in, in the musical landscape. And then we didn't do the licensing for that particular project just because that's a monster on its own, but also making sure that we were still in communication right, right. with the, the person who was doing all the licenses and clearances. And then doing a record deal, a soundtrack deal on top of that. So like that's that's a wow. pretty holistic view of like an extreme, um, an ex- a really extreme involvement. Difference. In, yeah. Yeah. So the job just seems to actually really oscillate from in different ways. And in, in this example, you said you weren't even doing the licensing side of mm-hmm. the job, mm-hmm. whereas in Waves, that was the the large the lion's share of kind of what you guys were taking care of yeah super interesting yeah you've you've mentioned um randy randall poster for uh a lot of this uh so far and and you've worked with him for the past 11 years um and he for those listening has been wes anderson's trusted music supervisor since they worked on the film bottle rocket together um how would you describe that creative relationship and do you find whether through Wes and Randall or through other working relationships that that you have that the scope of what you can bring to a project as music supervisor can kind of evolve and be more expansive the more that you work with someone and build kind of a trust and Mm -hmm, rapport mm -hmm. and that kind of thing um yeah well you know Randy has worked with Wes since Bottle Rocket. I started working with Randy in 2011. Mm -hmm. Um, And whenever it comes to certain certain directors like a Wes Anderson or a Martin Scorsese, who Randy is also a music supervisor for, I still work with Randy, but I take on a different role just because he's outward facing and these are his relationships. In regards to Wes, he's another director who, I mean, just by watching his films, anyone can tell, is so incredibly specific and precise in in what he wants to do. Um, I don't want to really necessarily speak about his relationship with Randy or vice versa, because it's it's not it's not my relationship. For sure, but. Um, I think that there is an incredible amount of 
mutual trust and respect for one another. But man, Wes has made us go down some insane fucking rabbit holes. <laughs> but it's like, it's like, hey, like, you know, we're here to serve this vision of this writer, of this director, of this auteur. So, you know, you you want you know you want this 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 crazy Russian song that is a folk song, but somehow it's still <laughs> under copyright. So I'm like getting on the phone with like a friend who speaks Russian who doesn't understand necessarily the ins and outs of music licensing, but like trying to <laughs> conference in this 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 Russian publisher and translating back and forth. And it's like okay, we'll do it, you know, yeah. or or you know, there that was for Grand Budapest Hotel, or it's like, you know, Wes really likes this one song that's written by a cymbalom player, the best cymbalom player in in <laughs> the Balkans. And it's like, okay, we'll find this guy. And like, you know, he turns out to be a mailman or some, some shit in his in his village. But it's like, so you know, there is there is, I know just because I'm so I'm sort of lower on the totem pole when it comes to to Wes's stuff. But Randy and I are like, shit, how are we gonna find how are we gonna find these people? Yeah. It's like we'll find it. We'll find it. Well we always find it. We'll always make it work, you know? And like so they're super fun. Yeah. And and, and it's I'm like, the more obscure they are, bring it on. You know? It's actually like very zen for me when a project like that comes up. Right. Cause they're saying, please go down this rabbit hole and you're like Alrighty. Like, don't come out until you bring me the fox, you know. Yeah. So, or well, the fantastic Mister Fox. So, <laughs> on your kind of own working relationships that have expanded, I feel bad for asking you about uh, Wes and Randy's that you can't speak to as much. But have you found that that has been something that's you know your your remit and and the scope of what you do has expanded and evolved as you continue to to work? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that. Um, anyone's work honestly is always expanding and evolving i mean i think you can also think of it as like an ex like a, a constant undulation mm -hmm. you know i'm working on a, a film right now that i'm i'm really excited about called swan song um at least that's the working title so if you go google it you'll you'll find it but it was written and directed by this really lovely thoughtful irish director named ben cleary most people wouldn't necessarily recognize his, his name if you're not in the industry, but he won an Academy Award for the best live action short film mm. a couple years back. And um, wow. this is his first feature and it's it's being produced by anonymous content and with uh, Apple Plus involved. And it's an incredible cast. I would say this is a very good example of sort of a, 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 a start to finish job because before they even started shooting it, um, there was many conversations with, with Ben about music that were relevant to the production, but also just in general. And, you know, Ben, ben is also the sort of director who's extremely musical and has, and has a very specific point of view. And so between talking about the musical landscape and then, you know, moving on to hiring a composer and, you know they are now finished shooting and they're and they're in they're an editorial phase, um, but now I feel like now is really going to be the bulk of our work um, in post production. Wow! But it's like I've been on since I don't know. I think the first time I spoke with him was last June. But like the conversations that we have, like yes, it's about music, but oftentimes directors will also they really want to know your opinion not just about the musical element but like the picture what do you think of the picture right. and um there has been times in the past where sometimes i'm like something's wrong like something's wrong with the editing it's not like you can try to have music do heavy lifting all you want but like if you keep trying you keep trying something's wrong it's like you might need to rearrange this. Like, this is a picture issue. This isn't a music issue. Wow. And that's happened. It happens. It absolutely happens. I mean, it happens that sometimes, you know, editors have to be replaced. Like, that happens sometimes. Just how sometimes composers are replaced or 
music supervisors need to be, you know, like <laughs> if something's not, and you can't be precious about it, but it's just like, if something's not gelling and you keep trying, yeah. then it's like, you got to flip it upside down or do something different. Um, you know, some of the best directors in the world, they really, they really, going back to what you asked earlier, they really do know the value of music. And I don't want to make a sweeping generalization, but everyone loves talking about music. Everyone. It's so fun going on set because I'm not there all the time when there's musical moments, but when I am, it's like, everyone loves talking about the music and, and, and they have their own opinions and ideas and, and their own personal um, connections to certain things. And I think that that is what makes music so valuable. It's so tangible and it's so personal to anyone. Yeah. No, that's really nice. I want to, I know you've been so generous with your time, Megan. So um, I kind of want to wrap things up, but get a little philosophical, but maybe not too philosophical. <laughs> but do you past kind of think decade in... plus that you've been supervising that the way music is used in, in film and TV series has evolved and changed as like an emotional channel or an aesthetic tool or a storytelling device and and how do you think this may develop in the future mm. i love how you asked me this on, on like our, the last question <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm gonna throw you i'm gonna throw you a fucking doozy um i mean i think that film and television in general has changed even within the past 10 years of of me working in this industry um, you mean mu I think musically, it, like obviously in general. For I sure. think I think in I think in general, film and television, the 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 way we consume it, the the material that's put out there, um, just period. I think it's it's ever evolving. You know, I mean, if you even go, you know, history lesson, if you go back to the 1950s, they, like very clearly, it always has evolved. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that music musical styles and music as a vehicle also has changed. I think that people are bolder in general in how they are approaching music and, and, and how they are using it in film and television shows or even in advertising, you know, people, people are bold or bolder, you know, like they don't want to be polite, which I love. Like that's actually one of my favorite things to, 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 one of my favorite comments when you see something you're just like it's just it's too polite like come on you have this badass character like don't yeah. be polite or flip it flip it on its head and make it so polite that it, it really highlights how right. impolite or bold this character is but um i just think yeah i think i think that i think that the the way people are approaching um soundtracks both score and licensed music, they are being bolder in their choices. Um, and there's almost a, a desire to be yes. bolder uh, from a viewer's standpoint. But at the same time, like classic score is a classic score or like you have a rom-com, like just give me, give me like give me the saccharin. emotional <laughs> saccharin, like give me you yeah. know, just like, just yeah. give it to me. Like, that's what I want. So, you know, I do, I do think that people are being bolder and more experimental. And from a compositional standpoint, um, I think composers have more room to play. I mean, really because of, 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 of specific soundtracks, like, you know, social network or, right. Um, Michael Abel's Get Out or, you know, like, so like there's, there's, I think, I honestly think that uh, there's, there's so much lateral and upward move. There's just room to play. There's more room yeah, to play. Sure. You, should, you should edit that whole thing. <laughs> that was just like a clunky. <laughs> I'm going to keep it clunky because it was just really nice to see your brain ticking away doing it. Um, Megan, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our chat. It was a lot of fun. And I think the work that you do is very uh, inspirational and very uh, just really good and very impactful. So thanks 
for your contribution. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Yo, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, Megan is a wonderful person and great energy and a lot of what she's worked on has moved me uh, emotionally. So I felt very grateful to speak to her. Oh, and I've got some exciting news. I'm really stoked to be extending Sound Scene beyond its original podcast iteration to a radio show on no Wave, which is a New York-founded, London-based cultural hub slash uh, radio station. Um, so yeah, a monthly show on there, and first episode is is really good, and super excited to be playing the music that we talk about. <laughs> um, so yeah, excited for that, and yeah, take care of yourself. Bye. Sounds sweet.